Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Launch Network. This is Carmen Denisco, your co-host for today's show of the ninth out of 10 edition of the UIA workshop series. We have had some huge success with this workshop. We're hearing from people all over, not just the U.S., from the world, not only listening live, but then they're going back and listening to all the past sessions, the episodes, getting the information, throwing in some questions. And uh, let me bring on my co-host and we'll see what else is happening. Hey, uh, Warren Tuttle, what's going on, my friend? Hi, Carmine. Good to see you. I love your shirt. Oh, thank you. Thanks, we man. Color. We need a little color on the show. Yeah, it's one of those things that it was the it was the, what, the last one in the closet, so I had to pull it out. Oh, maybe you're playing golf after this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There you go. Hey, Warren, real quick. I mean, I know we had some huge success, not only last week, but the, but the prior weeks. Uh, can you believe uh, the amount of people that have been, have been chiming in and asking questions and, and watching? It is great. And it's building. And uh, we're getting a lot, of, a lot of reaction. I got a lot of reaction during the week uh, from last, uh, last week's show as well, which is awesome. Um, we're definitely going to um, spend the summer getting ready for the fall. We we'll have a 12-week series. We're going to expand it, and uh, we're already making lists. If anybody, any in our audience uh, and our regular followers, because I know some people are listening every week, you know, want to email us, either me, www.tuttle at yahoo.com, or, uh, or if they want to email uh, Deb Hess or administrator at uiausa.org, um, we'd love to consider your ideas and maybe get some people on. And, and by the way, if anybody ever wants to offline, Carmine, talk to me, I'm giving you my phone number. It's 203-594-8808. That's 203-594-8808. You're all welcome to call. If I'm not here, I'll get back to you. If anybody has anything to add or say, you know, this is supposed to be an inclusive um, uh, series and it's an educational series and we want everyone to be a part of it. So, but it's really been going great, Carmen. And thanks, <laughs> thanks to you. You're the, you're the man. You're the you're the platform and you're responsible for, for putting this all together. So I appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate it. Not too often you get a... Uh a leader and public figure such as yourself giving out your personal number, but that is awesome. And I'm sure some people are going to take it up and give you a call, ask some questions, different things. One question that I've been getting, um, not only from this workshop, but uh, what's the update on the, uh, the hardware show? I, I know some people want to head out there. Good question. So it's still officially on as of right now, this moment. Uh, it's scheduled for September 1, 2, and 3, first, second, and third of September. Um, in Las Vegas at the convention center. Uh, I spoke to uh, Rich Russo, um, of, who, who runs the show for Reed Expo. And as of late last week, it's, it's all official. He told me if it's not, he'll get, let me know. Uh, they're polling their members. It will be a scaled down show. It will probably require masks. It will probably require six feet of separation. I'm sure our inventor area will be a little smaller. But uh, and I doubt if the big companies, you know, the really big, you know, probably Depot or Lowe's or those buyers, you know, they, they I'm not sure if they're if they're going to institutionally be allowed to go. But but it's a great show and great timing for the Ace and True Value and in the ind independent hardware stores. So I'm expecting, you know, um, the show to go on. And as of now, it is. And obviously, if we hear anything different, we'll let people know immediately. Cool. That's awesome. That's great. I, I am so glad. I mean, you and I both, we were preparing to go out and uh, we were happy to hear it was back on. So yeah, we'll, we'll keep a close eye on it. So, all right, cool, man. Well, I know we got the great guest today. Do you want to uh, do the honors? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm really excited today. Charlie Sowers, good friend. And I describe him as a, as a Renaissance man. He's an inventor. Uh, he's an author. Um, he is an advocate for inventor rights in Washington, DC. He's a former legislator up on the hill and so forth. And uh, we're going to talk today about uh, inventor issues in Washington, D.C. So it's my pleasure to welcome Charlie to the show. Charlie, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. And, and we were just talking before we came on about your bat collection back there. You want to, <laughs> uh, did, you, did you invent any of those or? Uh... <laughs> I, I made one. I, I actually made two of the bats. Um, so there's 50 baseball bats back there. My, um, mother was a photographer for the Kansas city Royals for 20 years. Wow. And, um, she found out that she couldn't really charge the players for baseball bats. So what she would do is give them a baseball, uh, give them a picture and ask for a baseball bat. So that's the payment, I guess, for 20 years of, uh, uh, photography, um, up there, but there's two bats, uh, on there that I made and I made, um, 
I made a bat in shop class. I asked my teacher if I could make one and he said, sure. So I went in there after school for like a month and made this bat and I thought it looked great. And I knew what baseball bats were supposed to feel like. I played college baseball. This was when I was a little younger, but I had grown up holding baseball bats and uh, I got this baseball bat off of the um, machine and felt it. And it just felt like a piece of lumber, but I took it to George Brett. And this is, I, I'm telling the full story because I think it's, uh, partially relevant to what we do in the inventor world, but I, I created a prototype and it just didn't quite feel right, but it looked right. It showed that I could do what I wanted to do. And I said, Hey, if I can make a better one, will you use it? And uh, he said, yes. And so I went back and made a better baseball bat. And I'll admit that the second iteration looked more like a softball bat than a baseball bat but it swung and felt right. And so he didn't use it in a game, but he ended up using it in batting practice. And I have a good quote in the newspaper of him saying he was going to change contracts after 20 years, <laughs> and, you know, so it, it was, it was a good experience. It's good to have on my wall and uh, it, it's a fun, uh, a fun discussion piece in the office. Oh, that's awesome. Does it have a little lightning um, rod in the natural? <laughs> that's what I was thinking. <laughs> it, it, uh, it has my version of it. It has, um, uh, uh, I think it's a Sourville bats and then it is uh, uh, sourized with a little lemon instead of the uh, lightning bolt. So as close as I could get to a lightning bolt. Sour bill, that's awesome. Hey, is that lighter weight one back there? Is that Freddie Potex or what? Uh, you know, uh, the, the lightest weight one I have is called the Pea Shooter, and that is from Kevin Seitzer, who is kind of a smaller, uh, a smaller baseball player for the Kansas City Royals, and I believe it was the smallest bat in the pros at the time. Um, I've got another one that's uh, Brett Saberhagen bat, that was, uh, I mean, he's a pitcher in the American League, so he wasn't a hitter. So it was one of the few bats he got for the World Series, which is kind of a cool one to have. There's a McGuire, a Canseco. Uh, it's kind of a good little history wall for that era of baseball. Sure. No, that's awesome. That's, uh, and I love that era. So, well, listen, we'll get back to uh, baseball another time, but that's a great, great story to start off with. Um, so Charlie, you listen. You you uh, for many people know you, of course, and for those that don't, um, you're very very active in inventor issues in Washington D.C. Both with uh, you know a lot of attorneys and lawyers, and you also do your own work. Whenever I come down to visit you in D.C., you're always lining up, um, go through the halls of Congress. It's an amazing experience. Um, maybe just bring people up to speed on on your organization, what you've been doing, and what's happening now. So my organization is the Market Institute. And as a part of the Market Institute, we run the Inventors Project. And basically the whole idea of that is to bring inventors together across the country and kind of help organize the inventors across the country and activate them uh, to deliver the message on Capitol Hill. So this all started back in the American Invents Act. And um, a couple of my inventor friends uh, emailed me and said, hey, have you heard of this bill? Um, it changes uh, the first to invent to first to file. And I was like, no, I haven't heard of it. No, Congress wouldn't do that. And it's not going to pass even if they did try to do that. And um, it turns out that I was wrong. I was dead wrong. And that email happened, I think it was like the end of January. I guess that that's 2011. And uh, that's about the time that it was passing out of the Senate. And so after it passed out of the Senate, we kind of activated our whole group of people together and went up into the House and started walking the halls of Congress. And we had five people at the time, um, but it was a good group of people. Um, you know, I think it was the inventor of on-demand TV. Uh, we had Gary Louder of um, the Estee Louder family, one of the largest donors on the left. and. Uh, which as an aside is why I love this issue. Besides the fact that I love inventing and um, I love innovation and I love what it does for the economy. Innovation and inventing on Capitol Hill is a bipartisan issue. And uh, it's one of the reasons that this is fun to work with. But so we had these five people uh, going around on Capitol Hill and there was a lot of other lobbying going on, but with a budget of $5,000, we hosted three events put out something like 20 op-eds, held about 50 meetings, and uh, we're crushing it. And in part because of that, 
the Republicans pulled the bill from the House floor and um, then they actually had to break three of the Tea Party uh, tenants that they had just passed to get it back on the floor and pass it before they felt that the momentum would stop it. And so it was, uh, we called it our beta test and we failed at our beta test, but the beta test itself was positive. There weren't inventors on Capitol Hill. Um, the inventor story, the small inventor story wasn't being told. The large corporations had people up there, but there was no small inventors walking around on Capitol Hill. And so from that, we built out what we've been doing and it's kind of progressed over the last 10 years um, into being a lot more formal. So now the inventor project helps run the Congressional Inventions Caucus. So actually after I get off of this, I get on another call with uh, Judge Paul Michelle and we're giving a 101 on 101 for Capitol Hill staff so that they can learn from the guy what 101 really means. And um, so Rayburn. it's exciting. Are you doing that in Rayburn? Is that the, the, the <laughs> Yeah, I, we're, we're still not back on Capitol Hill. Uh, so oh. it, although it's interesting, uh, I think that, you know, Skype, Zoom, whatever is a better platform. We're using uh, WebEx because that's the only thing that uh, the Senate can oh, host their events on, which is a fine platform, but it's interesting. Capitol Hill, uh, they don't have a lot of choices up there. So this is a WebEx event. Yeah, well, we, we had a similar thing a couple of weeks ago with the USPTO. They wouldn't use Zoom. So, but, uh, you know, Carmine, great story real quick. I can't pass this one up. One of my great travel experiences of all time. So Charlie invited me to come down and, and, and uh, do one of his educational forums that back when Rayburn was open and in, in August, I, I think it was two years ago. And, and uh, I, I uh, quickly booked my flight, said, sure, I'll come down. And um, I booked an 8.30 p.m. flight instead of an 8.30 a.m. flight. And it's, the event was starting at noon. And I get to the airport and early, at like 7 a.m., nobody stopped me. And then at some point I realized there's no 8.30 a.m. flight to D.C. from from Westchester. So I asked around and said, you know, you're an idiot. It's a p.m. flight that you booked. And I go, oh, my God. So I called Charlie. I said, Charlie, I may I may be a little bit late, but I, I ended up, long story short, running down to LaGuardia, jumping on a 10 o'clock flight, taking a cab over, like walked in the door right at one minute of 12. <laughs> and that explains this last inch of my hair receding. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I love Capitol Hill. So that that's what we do in that event in particular is um, it's my favorite event on Capitol Hill, uh, kind of working off that bipartisan thing. We aren't actually pushing any policy in some of our events. And so what we do is a week long educational series that teaches Capitol Hill staff how to invent. And uh, for those who don't know, the average age of a Capitol Hill staffer is 28. Um, they are generally well-educated, they are driven, and they're willing to uh, work on something that they believe on unbelievably hard. And if you take all of those words and just move them over to an inventor that you were describing, it would be the same thing, or an entrepreneur. And so we find that that market is perfect, and the whole goal is, A, either teach them to invent and make something cool, or teach them what it takes to invent so that when they see these issues in front of them, that they're confronted with their knowledge and that they understand what inventors need and they won't get in our way. And so I, I, I love those events and staff come up to me all the time and thank me for them and talk to me about ideas and talk to me about inventions. I think I've sent some people to Warren um, because of that, I mean, it, it's a great experience, but so that's really what I do day to day is I bring inventors to Capitol Hill to tell our story. And, um, I find that that is one of the most effective ways to actually, um, get our message onto Capitol Hill. Well, you, you, the, 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 the classes in the forum is terrific and you deserve just so much credit for pulling that together and, and bringing people in and keeping the issue front and forward. Now, I know you're also, you know, you follow the Inventor Coalition, is it? And there's a whole bunch of people and you know everybody in town. And of course, when we, we brought down the Inventor Club leaders uh, last year, you, you were kind enough to uh, bring us all together and, and meet a lot of folks. Tell us what's, before we get into the issues, just tell us how that works and, and, and what people are doing so inventors know that there's, there's a lot of people that are working on their behalf, which they may not be aware of. Well, I tend to work with, so, 
uh, I guess, first off, I, I should start, I have a, um, an advocacy hierarchy. And so kind of the lowest rung, I always say that people should be active. If you're not involved with government, government's gonna be involved with you. So you should do something, but you should understand the different things you can do and the different levels of effectiveness of those. And so one of those things is that you can call your congressman, you can write letters and you can send emails. Those are all um, effective, but I put them at the bottom because uh, actually I was the guy who used to answer those letters for Senator Grassley. Um, and I had the ability to sign his name and put it in an envelope and send it back to you. Now, there was a couple of checks and balances to make sure that I was saying the right things, but at the same time, uh, it goes to kind of the entry level staffer up there. Uh, depending on the member, it might raise up to that if there's a new issue. Well, did, you have like a, did you have a little stamp that said Chuck or something? And just no, you have an auto pen machine, which looks something like a, uh, a potter's wheel, but they have this uh, wooden disc underneath it that has um, waves and um, channels in it. And so it actually moves the pen around for a signature. It, it's one of the cooler machines. And it, uh, there's a skill involved in using it. So it has different speeds. So sometimes if there's a hot issue, let's say it's an NRA issue and you get thousands and thousands of letters, you'll uh, send people in there and have races to see how many you can sign. Um, and if you can turn that speed up, which is a talent, uh, you can get a bunch through, but it, it, it's hard, but I love the auto pen machine. Um, <laughs> So next up on the list is uh, our op-eds and uh, articles actually writing. And I think that there's a fight that these could go up higher on the list. But um, if I'm talking to an individual who's uh, doing things, op-eds fall at this level. But I always think that uh, you should write. And so instead of emailing your congressman, put it out in public where they have to actually admit that that's out there in the public and either respond to it or um, at least understand it and see it. And what I always say too is name check them because if you name check your congressman, guess what? They have, they have their Google search results up and so it pings it and it actually will go into their feed. So you actually get that two for one. It goes out into the public and they're going to see it and they get that reference that it's out in public. And then I have our two sets of meeting groups. So there's two types of meetings. You can do individual meetings. So the next step is an individual meeting with staff and then an individual meeting with the member Honestly, these are probably also at the same level as each other. Uh, uh, Congress, elected officials are busy. They have to raise lots of money and they're dealing with all of the issues and they are professional glad handers. I like a lot of them. I respect a lot of them. But when they see you, the kind of thing that is hitting them in the head constantly in their meeting is, am I going to raise money here? Um, and so it's important for the member to recognize and meet inventors and people, but the staff are focused on the issues and the staff have to respond to issues as they come out. So uh, I kind of put those at the same level. And then the next level are the group meetings. And that's where I, I started on this. Um, so group meetings with staff and then group meetings with members. And these I believe are separated because if you go in as a group to a member, the member sees it as a voting block. And if we go in as a group to staff, they can be a little overwhelmed. Um, they too see it as a voting block. They see it as something else. Uh, one of the ways I like to explain it is a single person might walk in there with a tinfoil hat and they've been sitting at home and they have their wild idea and they have enough time on their hands to call up the congressman and get a meeting and they have a tinfoil hat on and their, their ideas are crazy. But if you go in with a group of people, the fact is, is it's really hard to talk other people that have tinfoil hats to come in and agree with you and have the same message. So when you go in with other people, it's that instant credibility of this is a real issue. And uh, I, you can also bypass that. You can walk in with me. My whole career is based on getting credibility up there. But the fact is, is that walking in with that group, they instantly recognize 
this is a real issue and there's a group behind this. And so that is uh, something I find really important. And you know, it, it, it's, it's such a great experience for those listening who have never done it. It's almost like a life bucket list for those who don't live in the DC area to come in and actually participate in government. I mean, you really feel when you're walking through the halls and, and you're seeing, you know, I actually was in Chuck Grassley's office once when he came out and said, hello, how you doing? <laughs> you know, and you feel like you've seen these people on TV and then maybe you're part of it all. So it's kind of fun, but. It, it's great. I, I had, uh, when we were uh, lo- uh, working on the AIA issue, um, we actually had a guy who had uh, just been sworn in as a citizen the weekend before. And um, we went into uh, an RNC meeting. It was um, an RSE, the Republican Study Committee. They're the conservative Republicans who uh, on their face seem like they should be on our side, but this issue gets complicated on Capitol Hill. And so they were having a briefing that completely consisted of people on the opposite side of the argument as us. And uh, we were supposed to have a seat at the table. They ended up taking away our seat at the table, but they allowed us to go sit in the room that might have been worse, but th- this guy, he just, his, his face turned red. He was sitting on his hands and uh, it was awful. And so I think it is, a, it is a bucket list thing to see that you can actually make a difference. At the same time, it can be frustrating. Again, this is likely something that you've spent money on. You've spent your livelihood on. You're on Capitol Hill taking time out of your life. Um, to do it. And you're meeting with a 28 year old who doesn't have experience with the things that you had experience with. Now, I think that that is why you need to be up there. That 28 year old is smart. They're intelligent. Their job is to take in stories and experiences from other people. But that doesn't mean that it's not frustrating at the same time. Well, you know, there's a point when you have a child that's 28 years old and life changes and you look at everybody in a different way. So I get you. (laughs) But you're, but Charlie, you're working on, on, on you know, look, uh, we all know that it's an unusual time for the country and there's issues. We're also in an election year. So given all that, though, can, can you just sort of highlight the main inventor initiatives? Obviously, there's a few of them right now and, and generally what's going on and what you're doing. So we're generally in a, a good place. And I, I say generally, I, I think at the 20,000 foot level, we're in a good place. But as soon as you come down, it, things start breaking up a little bit. So uh, from the 20,000 foot level, uh, back in the AIA days, that whole bill was anti-inventor. I don't think that there was a provision in the bill that was pro-inventor. Um, and then when they passed that, we thought, you know, we have another 10 to 20 years. And it turns out a year and a half later, they introduced another bad bill. Right. And um, so we, we started fighting that and we were successful in fighting off the uh, second bill. But um, that group of people pushing for bad intellectual property still exists out there. And I, we call them, uh, they're intellectual property users. They're not the intellectual property creators. And uh, so that is troublesome. But as we um, have moved forward, we have not seen bad bills introduced in the past few years. And in fact, we've seen good bills introduced in the last couple of years. And I think right now, I, uh, I think that there's two pro inventor bills introduced at this point, And we're looking at a third to be introduced soon. And, um, Oh, they're, they're escaping me. The save the inventor, uh, uh, uh US inventor, right. Or us inventor. The, well, you, you, U.S. Inventor has a bill out, and um, I, I call that that's the aggressive uh, bill. It's a it's a very good bill. Everything in it's good for inventors. Um, on Capitol Hill, it's just going to be considered uh, aggressive. Nothing wrong with it. I support it. C- came out in support of it. I'll support it to the end because it it's really good for inventors. Uh, Thomas Massey, I don't believe, has introduced his bill this year, but. Um, it is uh, uh, what I call kind of the perfect inventor bill. It, um, it sets out everything you think the, the way that the system should work and goes and accomplishes that. And then we have uh, the last bill, which is more of a political compromise bill. It understands a couple of the big fights that um, uh, we're not really going to win on right away, and like PTAB. PTAB, the Patent Trial and Appeals Board is awful. It's a death panel for uh, inventors. 
Uh, Thomas Massey's bill takes it out. I think that U.S. Inventors bill has changed theirs where it might not take it out, but it basically takes it out. And uh, the uh, the political the bill, is the other one, the Stronger strong. Patents Act. Thank you. The Stronger Patents Act um, fixes PTAB. It, it makes things clearer. It makes things better. It doesn't go as far as we would like. But by not taking away PTAB, again, I think it was 97, 98% of senators voted for it. It makes it more politically possible. So I, there's different variations, but the takeaway is we have three bills that are pro-inventor that uh, all have different varying versions of momentum. And so that's a good thing for our community. If we come down though, to kind of the discussions of the day and what's going along, Right now, the anti-patent crowd is looking at COVID and they're looking at the vaccines and looking to take away the patents on the vaccines. And they're looking to take it away through March and rights or section 1498. Um, but either way, that is a rifle shot. It's a sniper shot at invention. And so I've been really active on pushing back at that and pushing the pro-inventor narrative. Now, uh, going back to the RSC, they just came out with a good document that is opposed to uh, the China stealing of our intellectual property. So uh, I'm getting ready to write an op-ed that points out that's awesome. They also need to look at the theft of intellectual property in the United States as well. Well, I wanna get back to PJ, but first let's just spend another minute on the COVID. So so it's, it's, a, it's a tough one, you know, it's like, how can you be against apple pie, right? It's, it's uh, you know, I, I've heard from many people, I don't know, it's, somebody's been putting this back out that Jonas Salk, you know, never charged and never made any money from the polio vaccine, right? So now, now whoever invents the solution to COVID, you know, shouldn't profit from it, you know? That's, that's like not right, it's not right for society, right? So, so this collective crowd and, and some of the big tech are sort of leveraging off that. Is that, is that, is that how you see it too? They're, to make well, I, I, I mean, I, I see that they're they're leveraging that. There's there's interesting pushback on the Salk story. I guess it wasn't actually uh, patentable by the time that um, he developed it. But uh, that, oh, somebody. <laughs> that that's quibbling. Uh, it, it means if you bring that up, it makes it really hard to win the rest of the conversation, even though you've won the the uh, the the mental exercise of, of the debate. But uh, yeah, I mean that's. That's what they're pushing for, but what they don't understand is the, the larger view here. Right now we have multiple companies racing to come up with a vaccine and you don't get multiple companies racing to come up with a vaccine if you don't have a prize at the end and you can't, and the government can't set that prize. I, I, I've, um, I've tried to move away from the prize award is what a patent is. But look, in the Constitution, it says that you get, uh, you get a right to these ideas for a limited time. It does not have a footnote that says, unless it's a really, really good idea, or unless it's really, really, really needed. And that is what our innovation system is based on. And I, you can't get away from that. And I don't really you know, they're moving towards COVID. They're going to come up with a vaccine for it. So honestly, public policy shouldn't focus on COVID-19. They should be looking at COVID-20, 21, 41. You need public policy that looks at the future. And I think that that's the winning argument instead of looking at the, the gimme culture. It, it's um, like uh, asking for the cheap candy canes that Santa hands out at the malls. It, it doesn't really do you any good except for right then at that moment. And so hopefully we can steer them away from it. But again, my, the mobs are talking. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's so interesting, um, the power of marketing on our whole industry, not just Capitol Hill, but, you know, inventors, all, all the stuff that we talk about in all these series. So it is amazing to me how, how people can turn these arguments around. And sometimes I read them in local papers or people say to at a dinner party or something, and you're like, you know, you can see how this manipulate, but I do want to go to back to PTAP because Charlie, you were you were um, with us last August, and uh, when we had a PTAP session uh, with the USPTO, uh, had a few few judges show up, and we had forty five inventor club leaders and a few other inventors in the crowd. You were there as well, and it got a little hostile, you know. But but I would I a couple of things sort of hit me then. So for those who are not familiar with PTAP, it's the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. It was part of, as Charlie says, the 2012 American Invents Act. 
And it was something that was legislatively put in. Charlie would be an expert on explaining, I'm sure, the details of how these things get put into bills. But at the time, I didn't know about it. A lot of people weren't so familiar with it. It was sort of the secret thing that they, they put into the bill. And basically, it legislates from Capitol Hill that what the patent office has to do. And in an essence, in a nutshell, and you can describe it better, Charlie, it allows, after your patent's been issued, you know, for someone to come back and have the same organization that issued it re-review it and and then um, actually even <laughs> take some of the claims of the entire patent away. And not everything is reviewed, obviously only successful things. That, the whole idea behind it was to, was to stop expensive court cases, but what's happened has been very anti-inventor. So so maybe try to just say a few words about PTAB and then just 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 for my own sanity, am I on the right track there? It seems, it seems like it's that little provision in the bill that came out from Capitol Hill that 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 does not give standing to patents when they get re-reviewed. You know, instead of going into a PTAB hearing where your patent is considered valid, like it would be in court, you're actually going back into the PTAB and they've removed the validity of it. So now you're, you know, all those gains that you've made, all the money you paid in, which is very disruptive. So maybe just talk on PTAB a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> PTAB is a death panel. Done. No. Um... So I'll explain how it got in because it, it's interesting and it kind of, um, my book's called Profit Motive, What Drives the Things We Do. I like looking at incentives. And um, so there was two things driving the policy debate for the AIA, and that was the troll narrative, um, that patent trolls were sending letters to mom and pop uh, coffee shop owners uh, saying that they had infringing Wi-Fi. And um, it, there was like a couple of stories of that actually happening, but the only uh, provision that actually dealt with that was pulled out of the bill before it was actually even introduced, um, which made it, I, my head was exploding during this whole debate. I couldn't figure out what was happening on Capitol Hill. I was like, okay, if I give you that, why did you take this out? And um, it didn't exist, but the PTAB stayed in the bill. And the idea was that, um, enforcing the patent was really expensive, really hard, really time consuming, and was a strain on both sides. And so they tried to come up with this ex, the idea was to come up with this expedited uh, court um, that could deal with patents. And what they ended up coming up with was a kangaroo court, an administrative court, um, and they didn't put any rules around it. And they didn't put any rules around it because that's the incentive on Capitol Hill. If they put rules around it in the legislation, it would have caused different political factions to fall away from the bill. And so not only did they pass a bad piece of legislation, they also didn't set it up right to control it. And so when it was set up, it was set up in the worst possible way ever. And um, uh, Josh Malone has a good article on this, but he talks about the different rule changes since PTAB has been introduced. Okay. And um, they, the first like three were all bad for inventors. And since then we've had director Yonku who has um, been making great strides and being pro inventor at USPTO and his management style and his leadership style is to turn the iceberg, not to blow the iceberg up. And so uh, the last two rule changes have been good, but they're, they haven't dramatically switched the PTAB. But just to say how bad it is, uh, one of the rules that was passed under, I think it was uh, Michelle Lee, said that uh, inventors could provide testimony um, before the uh, uh, case actually happened, but that the judges were supposed to view it um, as the like, it, as the uh, petitioner, or uh, they were supposed to view it in a bad light from the beginning. And so, one of the rule changes is that they can view it neutrally. And realistically, right. that's all we want. Uh, um, you know, as a as an inventor, as somebody who's pro inventor, it's easy to say that we would like them to be uh, to view it as the inventor's right. But uh, honestly, the way that the system will work best is if it's viewed neutrally by judges. And so it's like the least thing you can ask for. And it was still something that director Yanku took heat for and fire for. And yet he's uh, really, I think, been able to come out on top because it's a common sense change to just view things neutrally. 
Uh, he's been he's been terrific. And but you know, I think there's 300 PTAB judges, and, and to, to my understanding, none of them have really bench experience or or, 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 or real judges, right? And not, 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 they don't necessarily have expertise in the field that they're reviewing, right? Is that a fair fair statement? Yeah. Uh, I. It, what's fair is to call it a kangaroo court that doesn't have uh, any actual official rules. They go against judicial standards at almost every uh, turn. And, you know, judges are judges. I don't know that being having uh, a lot of people get hired into into spots, even though they don't have the resume for it. So I'm not going to attack that. I But at the same time, it doesn't matter. The rules that the people that are hired operate under are rules that are inherently anti-innovation, anti-inventor. So it doesn't even matter if they had judges in there or uh, people that we would consider good judges, they're operating under a bad rule system. It's like starting a baseball game five runs down because you're the uh, home team or something. That's that's not what you want. It's not a good oh, baseball game. Even worse, after George Brett hits a home run, they'll tell him it's too much pine you know, to Ah, that. don't do that. <laughs> but, it's, uh, but, you know, we did have a... A uh, pretty uh, exciting session uh, down in, down in Patent Office for those who are listening, and we were all set to have another PTAP session um, with the PTO in March when the virus hit, and so we had to push the whole thing back. But we do want to come back, folks. Uh, stay tuned for our fall schedule because in September and, and Charlie too. We'll, we'll we want to get you back involved. We, we're going to have a session with with uh, the judges and, and continue this because I think we need to keep speaking up. I I like to think that you know some of the things that we've had to say are being listened to now, but. Um, so, uh, so tell us what else is going on now, Charlie. Look, I know you're. Tell us just about the coalition of of people, attorneys, firm people that are working all the time, having meetings. I get your notices. I really don't attend, but there's an awful lot of people, companies, and and that have interest in in, in helping inventors, or let's just say on the same side as inventors. People may not be aware of. Can you tell us a little bit about that and share what's going yeah. on? I actually just realized as I went back to tell my long story that I had ignored the, uh, it was a great political uh, answer. Um, so uh, a lot of times when I go into meetings, I go into meetings and you go in with a coalition and maybe the easiest way to understand this is like the first meeting I went into for AIA, it was the weirdest meeting I have ever had on Capitol Hill. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm a libertarian. I'm an economist. I've always been a libertarian and an economist. Um, and politically, that's where I've stood. And uh, But you have friends on Capitol Hill. And so you end up getting called into meetings. And the first meeting I had uh, was in the judiciary, the, the Democratic Judiciary Committee staff offices. So uh, libertarians kind of flowed in between um, uh, fiscally, we're usually further right. So on business issues, like that's like the last place that you would be. But we're, I'm in there. And then uh, with me is the, I think the Heritage Foundation was in the room. And um, then uh, uh, the Eagle Forum was in the room as well. So we had the, the Libertarians, the Democrats, the conservatives and the social conservatives all around one table all working on one idea, and that was to save inventors. Um, and so the idea of the coalition is to kind of do that when we go into other meetings. And so um, we go in and uh, we now have some other people that also represent small inventors. So I represent uh, our group of inventors. We have another guy who, um, USIJ, um, those are kind of the uh, tech in small inventors, uh, part of the Wi-Fi uh, inventions. Um, and then some of the bigger groups, uh, Qualcomm, um, trying to think of all the other ones. They're large patent portfolios, right? And, and, yeah, uh, it, what they are are uh, research-oriented groups. Bio's in there, the medical device guys. A lot of the colleges are a part of our uh we have a, there's a diverse wide coalition that is the, includes the colleges and us and the big guys. They have another coalition that's kind of just the big guys. And the way I like to say it is, look, they have big interests. So as inventors, we want the perfect system. Um, and so the big guys might not be with us all the way to the end of the fight, 
Um, but that's because they're dealing with 9 million other issues. And so politically, they, have, they can't push as hard as we can. So if we're winning, they might stop pushing uh, halfway. But, you know, if we're not out polling, it stops there. So as long as we're polling, um, it's good. So they invite me to their meetings. And it's actually, it, it's kind of fun to look and listen at how the big guys work. And at the same time, uh, see how similar the arguments are. I mean, they spend money on R&D. If, if patents are made less valuable, they make less money. It's the same thing for a small inventor. If a patent's made less valuable, it's harder to exert that patent. It's harder to license that patent. Or even if you're going with a non-patented idea, it's still harder to license it because the company that gets it can't defend it. And so there's all sorts of levels, but it, it's fun in the meetings because we try to do a small inventor, a large corporation, and then some form of a, a ideological group on the side of the meeting that we're in. So if you're meeting on the left, we try to do something over there. And if you're meeting on the right, we have somebody like Eagle Forum or the Heritage Foundation or somebody else in the room too. Well, I always, I always say that, you know, in this whole fight, what I've observed is, is inventors like hobbits, you know, there's all these big, with big swords and big fighters and, you know, ha having sword fights and the hobbits are running between their legs, you know, and, you know, we, we were almost ignored, except that I do like to say this, the Hobbit does have the ring. So, you know, you got to listen to us, you know, at the end of the day, but hey, so Carmine, um, it's always a good point to jump in. I'm sure we have uh, listeners and questions and um, uh, yeah. you want to, you want to throw a few out to Charlie? Yeah, this is, uh, we had a bunch of questions, but to me, this is fascinating. Even when you think, you know, what's happening when somebody like Charlie is breaking this down, uh, it's amazing what you guys are doing, Charlie. I thank you so much for doing what you do. Um, I didn't know that it was so strategic. I mean, it's, it's really, I mean, you're playing out a, a strategy, right? All the time. Yeah. It's, uh, it, and it's an interesting strategy and it's one of the things and, um, it's interesting to go into meetings. I, I, uh, went into a meeting, Warren and I have done a lot of meetings together. So we, we have, I know his story. He knows what I'm going to do. He knows how these meetings are going to go. Um, I walked into a meeting, a healthcare meeting a while back with um, a doctor that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was going through, I knew her basic story, but she was starting through her story. And she was like, yeah, I do uh, house calls for uh, teachers and preachers and uh, give them free care. And then she paused and she was like, unless they're Baptist and then kept going. And I was like, wait, what happened? And, uh, and the, the member, his jaw dropped and my jaw dropped. And then she was like, ah, I was just joking with you. And I was like, oh my God, you just changed my day. But um, it was awesome. It broke it down. It brought them down to um, kind of being at the personal level and it made the meeting fun. But yeah, I mean, the thing is, is you have a targeted group of people. Um, you have 535 people. They have a history of voting. They have a party. And so we understand where that is. We understand the legislative history for what has happened with the bill. And so you're kind of massaging that. And now I'll, I'll be the first to admit that at times that also closes you in. So if you're working on a specific invention or a specific idea, sometimes it's hard to approach you know, creating a new car engine if all you've done is create car engines. And instead, if you're some dude tinkering in his garage, maybe you come up with a whole new thing because you don't know what's been done in the past. And so uh, we've seen that be effective too. But a as a group, one of the things that I try to do is um, try to translate kind of the, the people that are coming in with the wild ideas and understand their ideas and communicate to them what we're trying to do and see how that can work into kind of the overall, because there's no control over these groups, but we try to work with each other to kind of move in the same direction. And then you know where you have a uh, backstop and where you have defense. And, um, and that is especially important in op-eds. If you're going to put out articles, we, we talk about what issues are going on 
so that we can all hit on the same thing at the same time. And then when that's happening, that you start that echo chamber where it, it might sound bigger than it is just because you're all working on it at the same time. Charlie's, Charlie's gift is he, his, the strategy starts with just organizing. If he has a group of like 30 people, you have to meet at certain times. You got to be in the cafeterias. The buildings and the halls are complex. I always like going to meetings with Charlie because he knows where to go. But if you're not in his group, he might say, you know, you have to be, you know, Rayburn 223. And it, just getting there is, is, is uh, you know, and, and on time. So the whole thing is it's a fascinating experience. And uh, we'll try to let the better community know when we do it the next time. There, there's a rule on Capitol Hill if you ever get lost, though. Whatever meeting you're going to, the elevator that you get out of is on the opposite side of the building than where you want to go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, right. by, the way, yeah. by the way, you hey, also Charlie. have to listen to Charlie because he's some things aren't always intuitive, you know. Of course, my first time down there, you know, I was like, let's do this, let's do and you know, Charlie had to slap me around a little bit. And this is not how we're doing it. We you gotta you gotta think of these things. So it's all it's all the whole thing is a great question because it's all very strategic from the from the <laughs> lowest levels up. So uh, yeah, this is awesome. It, it really is. I, I, I am looking forward to kind of coming up there. I'd love to experience some of that. So one of the other questions. Um, we had pop in like several people when you mentioned who the heck is, who the heck could you describe somebody who is anti-patent, which is, <laughs> which is, it, 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 it's unheard. It would be crazy for me to think that somebody was anti-patent, but there obviously are some people that would like to see no patents, right? Well, um, so I have uh, tried to get them out of my vocabulary when attacking <laughs> this because it's, it's actually shown to pull poorly. But um, that's uh, uh, an example of who we're fighting against in this is Google. Uh -huh. And um, the, what happens is, and, and honestly, I don't blame them as a company because um, as a company, you view things differently. And so they're trying to push things that benefit their company. They, I do blame congressmen who look at it as good public policy because it's not good public policy. But if we look at Google as a business, they're an ad company. They benefit from getting ads to people and they need as many different platforms as they can to deliver those ads and get the data. And so uh, if you look at it, this is like a home builder, a cost of a home builder doing business is wood. So a uh, cost to an ad company of getting their ads out is the technology. And so all that they're doing is lobbying for lower technology costs. That's like home builders lobbying for lower lumber costs. Um, Congress would likely laugh in their face if home builders were doing that, but that's what the ad companies are doing here. And so, yeah, Google has a ton of patents, but realistically they do a lot of that in, in defense of, of the small guys. And they passed AIA and you change the first to invent to first to file to defend against the small guys. And so a lot of the big guys are trying to pull up the ladder behind them, uh, which is also why I like our coalition. The coalition of groups that we have are a lot of uh, corporations that aren't trying to pull up that ladder. Um, and that's why it's more of a comfortable coalition. But if you're a big guy and you already have your market, um, if you make technology or innovation easier to steal, easier to get, easier to mimic, um, it's harder to become the next Google, the Google 2.0. And so they have to face less competition. And so I don't want to just uh, look at them. Uh, Apple's been a problem. Um, there, there's a lot of different people in that space that have uh, come up, but they funded a lot of the opposition. But you have to put that also in combination, Carmine, with a, a, a general sense that, that younger folks, I'm, I'm making a generic statement, a little bit more collective, group oriented, like look at the maker movement. They're not quite as interested in patent patents. Um, there's a feeling that people should share stuff. People haven't experienced the economic gain of holding a patent and profiting from that and so forth. And so that's an easy group to like my kids when I talk to them, you know, uh, one of my daughters is a regular at a maker space up in New Haven. And, and you know, she, she, you know, they, they, she's not into the, you know, the individual or the protection of the individual, which which you know, I'm sure Charlie would agree is, is what the patent system is all about is, is, is sort of leveling the playing field. So 
You I just what? disagree with you on attacking young people. I tend to blame oh. the boomers. Oh yeah, well <laughs> they they want the they want their social security no matter what. So that's the I I don't think that I don't really think that we change over over age. I think that we we've seen that age group um, tend to have some some sort of that line. I think that. They've had less experience. I think with the younger you are, you've had less experience with long run economics to see that um, business growth and see what's come out. And I also think that you see the internet and you experience the Google search page, but you don't experience the um, research and innovation that went into uh, having cross-browser integration that went into getting that fiber to your house, that went into creating the 5G chip that runs in your chip in your phone, or the fact that like Qualcomm uh, uh, changed uh, fax packet data into being able to actually pull up a website on your phone. So I think that we we're also in this weird time that it's just all in our face where you experience this end, but you don't see what's behind it. And so, I mean, you know what, um, there was more patent litigation during the sewing machine wars. And um, I, I think that um, when you look at those, you could actually see the innovations and they were small and minuscule, but um, I think that that was even something physical. So um, it's, it's interesting to look at. I, I don't, I don't think it's a, a generational thing. I think it's a technological place that we're at where we see a lot of the end uses. Well, I, I, yeah, I don't disagree, but it's a, it's a collective sort of versus the individual. It is always fun when, uh, you know, Google is the, is, is the lar largest lobby uh, group in, in DC and, so, and they have very deep, deep pockets. So, you know, when, you, when you're on the other side and trying to have that conversation with them, it, it's, it's, it's not easy. But what it is fun is you're down there all day walking around and. And 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 then and then you have to go to dinner and you don't know where the restaurant is. So what is the first thing you do? You, you Google where it is. You know. So I figure you know every jihad we're allowed to do that, right? Now. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Just follow me. I'll take you to the Capitol Hill Club. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, we're we're kind of getting low on time, Charles. This has been awesome. So one of the questions is, um, oh well, I have a whole bunch of questions. Maybe I'll send these out to you afterwards. Um, how can a, a grassroots inventor say locally start getting involved and work their way up to helping you? So first off, don't work up uh, to uh, helping me uh, email me Charles at marketinstitute.org. Um, but also uh, pay attention to that hierarchy, uh, send emails and write letters, write op-eds. If you write an op-ed or uh, how, how do I say this? I will help you write an op-ed. Uh, I would like you to take your time to write it and then send it to me to look at and edit. I, I publish two or three op-eds. Uh, I probably publish uh, five op-eds a month. So I'm writing all the time. Mm. Um, so send me an op-ed, have me look at it. Um, and then when it gets published, or if you don't send it to me, when it gets published, send it to me and we can promote it, send it to Warren and they can promote it, send it out and let other people know about your work. And then go and meet your local legislators, go to their offices in your state and create that relationship. Um, that's what they're there for. They're there to, to make that relationship. So I guess it's looking at that hierarchy and seeing what you have time to do. Um, and if it's just send off an email, then just send off an email. But if you can write or you can go meet with them, go do that and uh, take your time to do that. I think it's important. And it helps me out up here. If you're meeting with a member in its state and I meet with him up here, he's like, oh yeah, I heard about wow. this issue before from an inventor. Mm. Yeah, that, you know, it's a, that's a great way to put it because most people think they're just one person. How can they make a difference? But the way you just explained it, it shows how that one person can make a difference. Yeah, I, it, it's a smaller world than we think and then we view. And on Capitol Hill, you need um, 
uh, larger numbers sometimes in a, in a state, but you can do, you can have five people and make a fairly large difference up, up here. It's a multiple of that, but it's still 20 people. It's not a gigantic number. So uh, it's kind of amazing what you can do if you organize it and move in, in a direction. And so uh, I think it's important for everybody to get involved and everybody to know what they're doing. It doesn't take that many people to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. You know, you know, Warren was involved in that stuff at, uh, at Woodstock. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've seen pictures. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Warren, we're going to start closing up the show. Uh, we've had uh, a lot of people ask for the contact information, Charles, uh, Charlie, that's what, so you gave that out. That's awesome. Um, and, uh, Warren, what do we got uh, coming up for uh, next week? Well, I'd love to thank Charlie. Uh, everybody, Charlie's a United Mentors Association board member and uh, really appreciate everything you're doing, Charlie. And can't wait till the virus to clear so we can all come down and visit with you again. Um, we have one more session, uh, June 25th, a week from today, which will be with Roy Morjan. Roy is, um, uh, is the, probably the number one Kickstarter Indiegogo crowdfunding uh, master of the universe. Uh, he's had over $70 million raises. And um, he's always uh, a real educational treat for everybody. So um, that'll be next week. And then we're going to, um, you know, head off for the summer when things are a little bit slower, but we're definitely um, going to have a great slate in the fall. And we would love to, you know, Charlie, have you come back and we're definitely going to do a PTAP session. And, you know, the more we do these, the more I think of things, Carmen. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Charlie, this was, uh, I want to say enlightening, you know, a lot of people like I, even myself think they know how it works. Um, but how you explain it now, I see that everyone should get involved in some way. You don't just sit on your couch and complain and say, you know, I hope somebody else does it. I think that uh, what you guys are doing is awesome. I, again, I thank you so much. Thank you. It's the, the sausage factory is real, right? You can go in and tour the sausage factory and actually try to move a machine around. So, uh, but it's still a sausage factory. Yeah, no, no. Very cool. We, and, and, and Charlie, where can we ride if we want a baseball bat? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Louisville slugger. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much um, again, Charles. Um, and of course, Mr. Warren Tuttle, thank you for both for spending your time today, giving us some help. We will be back next week, same time, same channel. Please, all you out there listening, jump on, listen in live, spread the word. Also, if you haven't done already, uh, subscribe to our channel here on YouTube. Also, please go on out to the UIA website, UIA UIAUSA.org and join up for the OA. It's free, and that's one way you can start being involved. So for myself, Carmen Danisco, for Mr. Warren Tuttle, and Charlie Sauer, we thank you for listening, and we will catch you next time on UIA TV. You all take